Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Let's talk sex education for kids in Nigeria. It's a conversation that's been regarded mostly as a taboo in this part of the world. But today, we'll be breaking down those barriers and having an open conversation about sex and education. Um, let's say good morning to our guest, the founder of Brave Heart Initiative for Youth and Women, Ms. Priscilla Usiobaifu. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Now, when we talk about sex education and children, I want you to give us, you know, what exactly comes to mind, especially for parents, and why it's regarded as a taboo topic in this part of the world. Depending on the parents, I know for those at the rural communities, they have more reservation. But with better education, we see a lot of parents. For majority of the parents we interact with, the first trigger now is abuse. Hmm. The first thoughts that now come to their mind. Previously, it used to be promiscuity. But now we are beginning to see a shift from, oh, if you deal with the bad sex, then my child is going to be promiscuous to, is there a possibility of an abuse? So this discussions vary depending on the variety of rooms and different backgrounds. Okay, uh, well, t tell us a little bit more about, um, we we're talking about sex education for kids. Um, what age are we referring to here? You know, and at what age would you advise that it's, it, it's important um, that parents should start to have that conversation um, with their kids? Our discussion today is focused on children so I'm um, putting a description of the Nigerians' definition of a child as 17 and below. So I assume that every child is 17 and below. But we also know that even among this category, you have those that are 10, um, um, let me say one year to 10 years, then 11 to 14. Most time, the resistance is always at the younger children. That's when you see the resistance that come in. But it's also because of misinformation. And why do I call it as mis? I don't want to use the word ignorance. I'm very careful. Ignorance means you do not know. But misinformation means that you know, but the knowledge that you have is not accurate. So it's incorrect. And that is what is happening with sex education. Even the woman in the rural community that hears about sex education, it doesn't mean that she does not have an idea about what sex education is. But the point is that the idea she has about sex education is misinformed. And it is the misinformation that have driven the myth and misconception around this subject that have led to some of the challenges that people have today. When people have a better understanding of what it is about, then they will be able to know whether to make the choice of embracing it or accepting it. Going back to your question about what age that I think, I also think about what I would call age appropriateness of education. And this is not just about sex education, it's education generally. We know clearly that if you have a son in primary two, and I have, let's assume he's five years old, and I have a son who is 12 years old, and he's 12. So your son is six years old, and my son is 12 years old, which means my son is double of the age of young son, even in their basic numeracy and the literacy, let's use the two popular subjects of math and English, they are not going to be at the same level of teaching, the same level of understanding. And this is what we need to also bring into sex education, because sex education is just a form of other kind of education that we do. And for me, I tell people that the best approach is sexuality education. So you may ask, so what's the difference between sex and sexuality? Sex education is just a component of sexuality education. Sexuality education is broader. You are not just dealing with, with the biological issues. You are also dealing with life skills, which are very important for children as they grow up. Because the child, as soon as you give birth to that child, she, that child is alive, is a living human being, and definitely needs the skills and knowledge to be able to survive as we live. Okay, I have lots of questions from what you've said, um, but I want us to go further, further down um, your answer. You earlier talked about um, the fact that it's not ignorance but misinformation, especially in the rural areas. Could you shed more light on the misinformation that 
lots of Nigerians have regarding sex education and what the accurate information is and should be. I'll give you a classical example. In 2012, we approached um, a secondary school, a private secondary school in Igara. Igara is the local government headquarters of a Koko Edo local government area in Edo State. We had a grant from the International Women's Health Coalition, they are popular, popularly known as IWAC in the US, to conduct comprehensive sexuality education for rural schools, you know, young um, people in rural schools. And this school was one of the schools we had approached. We wanted secondary school, not even primary, as at then. And her response was, oh, I understand that some of my students are sexually active, which I do not support. But with you coming to talk about sex education, I'm going to be dealing with a whole lot more. Because if more people know about sex, then there are chances that a lot more are going to try their hands wow. on it. I'm trying to use paraphrase her. So indirectly, she stated that if we come to educate them about sex, then they may want to what initiate sex. I took time to explain to her that from evidence, because I needed to show them with data and every other thing. And I used myself as a young woman who grew up in a rural community in those states. I had information on sex. I knew about conduct as a younger girl. I knew that conduct could prevent sex. I knew about um, negotiation skills. So if I did not, if I wanted to abstain, for instance, because all we keep hearing is telling your girls or your boys to abstain from sex without teaching them how to abstain. So it's different with what? The how is the methodology? What approaches are you going to put in place? Which means first you need to say what? No. And that is what we refer to as refusal skill. You also need to negotiate because there are situations where you are going to tell the person no, and the person refuses to accept your no. They feel, oh, with a little more maybe peer pressure, a little more in, um, incentive or inducement, okay, Priscilla, as the case Priscilla, may just be, hold on for that a this person will Priscilla, we, we'll, for. We'll talk I about, did all this. Priscilla, can you hear me? This woman, oh. Yes, clearly. Yes, uh, we'll talk more in detail about these tactics, these skills you're talking about regarding sex education. But can we um, stay on course regarding this misconception, the myths that are... This information. So, yes. so she, she held on with her beliefs. She had religious beliefs about it. So despite my education, as the case may be, or information, it didn't work. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that it was instant. So I left and I approached other schools. Then something happened in her school. A young girl who had um, a, a, a core member who was posted to her school had asked an SS3 student in that same school to come to the house, you know, to assist with some domestic work and led to um, attempted um, exploitation. I'm going to use the word sexual exploitation, you know, try to touch her without her consent, and she had to report to a teacher in the school, and it got back to the proprietress of the school. At the end of the day, I was invited back to the school two years later because they had other incidents that happened that like, oh, if we had told this person on this thing and this other approaches, and by the time I was invited back, not only was I given opportunity to educate the secondary school, they asked that I please integrate primary four, primary five, and primary six. It was us that we're now saying, okay, because of the way our modules were structured, we were working with age. So even if you wanted primary five, they needed to reach age 10 because we structured our modules in such a way that you had 10 to 14 and you now had 15 to 18. So at every point in time, age appropriateness is key. Sometimes you also don't blame people for misinformation because we do what they call information overload. So if you get a two-year-old and say condom, for instance, a two-year-old may not understand what condom is. So it's not appropriate to discuss condom at that point. So what you do is to start with building of what I call the interpersonal skill with your child. The same way you tell a child, say thank you. The same child, it's the way you tell a child, say I am sorry. You know, the same way you tell a child, drop it. You know, your child is trying to pick something that belongs to another person and say drop it. So that's how you start this communication about bodily autonomy. And that is one of the main benefits that we have because with bodily autonomy,
comes with identity, comes with self-esteem. So this is why it is very important that the mindset that people have, we engage them in such a way that we can change their mindset positively. Okay. Now, I, I want us to talk about the um, male-female uh, perspectives. Uh, do you think that the conversation should be different, um, you know, to a female uh, um, kid, you know, and of course compared to a male? Um, or should, you know, the conversation on sex education uh, be the same across board? It's basically the same. It's just um, in context, um, looking at their identity, sexual identity, um, to know what and what to discuss. For instance, when we look at the um, anatomy of a female and the anatomy of a male, um, they are the same. They are different, so we are not going to use um, the same terminologies, for instance, to describe their body parts and all that. So that's just the difference. But when you look at the principles of life skills, it's going to be the same. If you need a young girl to, to be assertive, you also need your boys to be assertive. And I believe you, you people are also having statistics of boys that are also um, with low self-esteem and boys that are having poor um, self-identity. Um, boys that are having difficulty with communication, boys that are having difficulty with bonding with their family, either with their parents or with their guardian. So these are conversations that has to happen across the sexes. Okay, so when it comes to the homes, for parents that are watching this program right now, how would you advise mothers and fathers to begin to learn, first of all, because you can't give what you don't have, to begin to learn about sex education and how they should communicate that to their children such that they have that body autonomy that you talked about? So I, I, I normally use what I call teachable moment. You know, uh, when a guest comes into your house and then you see your child staring at your guest drink, maybe you offered the, 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 the guest a drink, and then you, you saw the reaction, you try to do what we call non-verbal communication with your child, mm -hmm. and your child don't seem to get it, and then you move into verbal communication, because you were seeing that moment as a teachable moment. So as parents, we also need to look for a teachable moment to pass this information. They are not your regular homework that the child comes from school, and then you say, sit down, I'm going to take you through your homework. So it's first for us to identify what teachable moment are for our children and take advantage of those opportunities. But first, if we have to pass the knowledge based on what we said, it's for us to also look for opportunities. What Post TV is doing this morning is creating an environment, a very conducive environment for people to learn. So that is what you are doing as a media person. So there should be other opportunities, either in their churches, in their community meetings, in the local group meetings, as many opportunities. But first, you need to open your mind. So many parents in Nigeria, they need to be open. And what do I mean by being open? To unlearn. There are so many things we already have. We need to first agree sex education is needed. We, yes, it's, it's, it's going to be age appropriate, but first you first have to agree that it's something that is needed. Then with that, you now have openness to knowledge that is going to be coming in. As you assimilate, you also take time. You know you need to process it. Because as a parent, you are coming with different ideology and mindset about these issues. So when you are able to process it, you are able to accept it first as yourself and see how it benefits your child. Then you begin to take it gradually. Also, don't forget that children learn at different um, speech or, or, or what I call it pace. So you also need to understand the individuality of your own child and say that, yes, there are children that are naturally smart, that you discuss this thing once you pick it, but there are others that you know you need to take it periodically, um, repeatedly, and I always tell people that repetition is the law of deep and lasting impression. So you know you need to repeat it again, you have that conversation again, take another time to have the conversation, their answer is around, you have the conversation, and that is why when we tell this holistically, as you as your parent is educating your child at home, the school are also creating opportunities to have conversation around this subject, and then it continues around, and then it becomes a societal educational structure. Practical tips that parents can actually learn from you right now. Practical tips on sex education. Um, maybe because of the field of work that I am, um, it's sad. I like to use the word. If you check most of the surveys that 
come up all the data and statistics since COVID last year. And you, I, for me, I'm worried by this data showing that because the schools were shut down and children were home, we recorded higher incidence of sexual violation of children. Not just sexual, physical, all forms of violation of children. Now it brings to mind, or to you, if the school were shut down, where were these children? They were supposedly where? At home. And we keep saying that the family remains at home, become the first unit of what? Of socialization, of education, of bonding, of development. So are we saying that our homes are that unsafe? Mm. Because th this data, you know, they are staggering. They are outrageous. And that means that we need to do far more work in our homes. So why will a woman who didn't go to work because there is COVID stay at home and the husband find it as an opportunity to be battering her? Because we also need to understand how domestic violence have a cyclical effect on even our children. And all the sex education we are talking about, when the father at home is raping the wife, and the child is at home, watching out, mommy is struggling with daddy when these things are happening. All these cycles of violence that we see happen. So please, as parents, parenting is intentional. I don't have my biological children yet, but I know the kind of, I, I now watch like a hawk. And for me, it is sad. Because one of the first things that sexual predators have done to our communities is to remove that sanity in our homes. You know, your home is supposed to be a safe environment. When you make your home unsafe, when you make the school unsafe, there are a lot of effects that that happens. Even when your child is not yet violated, you become paranoid. You want to put extra measures in place. But like we say, you are better safe than what? Than sorry. But one thing I need to encourage parents and guidance today is to know what the benefits of sex education is. The benefits of educating your children on sexuality, on building their life skills. Because when you do this, when they have positive um, bodily autonomy, they have good self-esteem, they have good body image, and they are able to accept others. What do I mean by accepting others? It brings us back to the question your colleague asked about male versus female. That if I am a six-year-old girl who has an eight-year-old brother, I have a vagina, my brother has a penis. Because they have educated them about sex, I do not see my brother as being abnormal as a child because I know I'm female and my brother is what? is male. Sex education has made me understand that my brother's biological system is different from me. Sex education brings bonding. Yes, bonding is very critical because when you have a good bonding with your child, it also strengthens communication. And we know that parents who exercise healthy communication with their children and have a better, effective, and efficient communication raised better children. These children are going to transition to young adults. Okay, it's unfortunate yeah, there. Lost it, yeah. That we seem to have happened. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was also going to, you know, hopefully mention with the time that we have, if there were other um, angles that needed to be added to the conversation. You know, aside sex education, you know, letting them know about their genitals and, you know, body, um, um, you know, anatomy and not Very all that. important. Um, Very I important. think it was, uh, there's also things that have to be added to the conversation uh, with regards self-control, uh, with regards respecting, you know, um, you know the um, opposite sex and some of all of that, that I think is also lost completely in conversations concerning sex. And hygiene um, as well. Yeah, and hygiene also. Sexual you know, but, health. Yeah, you know, but I think, you know, with, you know, as um, with age, you know, like that's why it was great that she she differentiated between the 1 to 10, mm -hmm. you know, 10 to 14, 14 to 17. So with age, you know, some of all of that needs to be um, filtered in here and there. Um, but because, you know, I think that we've also had um, a very poor conversation to um, young males across Nigeria with regards um, respect for females and, you know, and for the opposite sex, for consent um, and some of all of that. Um, I think that's one of the things that I feel must be also added to the conversation. Um, or I think we have our back, um, Ms. Usiobaifu. Uh, can you hear us clearly? Yes, I can. Okay, so I, I was just going to ask, you know, if you, if you thought that it was also important that we also filter in or add some extra, you know, details here and there to the sex um, education uh, conversation as kids grow up, you know, things about consent, about hygiene and respect for, you know, the opposite sex and some of all of that, you know, is there, is there also the importance that, or is that also an important part that needs to be added to the conversation 
um, you know, yeah. with sex education? If, if, you, if you remember clearly, I started by talking about the need for sexuality education by not limiting it to sex. Because when you deal with sexuality, then you are dealing with life skills. And in life skills, you are going to learn about boundaries. It's very important that everyone, and when you teach your child about boundary, you know, behavioral patterns are not automatic. They are going to learn it what? Over time. A child that knows that, you know, don't cross here, will probably grow up like that way. And that's why evidence you see is showing that children who have compressive sexuality education delay sexual debut. It's facts. There's evidence, there's proof globally, not just in Nigeria, that if they have proper education, if they have comprehensive sexuality education, there are chances that that child is going to delay sex until adulthood or until other time. And even if they are going to engage in sex as an adult, there are chances that they are going to engage in protective sex there are chances that they are not going to engage or they are not going to forcefully force others, either a girl forces a boy or a boy forces a girl. And that's where this discussion of consent comes about. And it is very important that our sex education is comprehensive. I beg us, let's have comprehensive sexuality education. Because when it's comprehensive, you deal with all these other issues that are associated. And one way to deal with Consent is by looking at patriarchy. Because consent does not just exist on its own. A lot of persons I like to um, use young men. Yes, we understand that there are women that also do not um, obey consent, but most of the time it is men we see forcing um, women to um, have sex against their will or using other means. And although we agree that the discussion should be for everyone, but it is the toxic masculinity in our homes. Why, what do I mean by toxic masculinity? When you have raised your son to always have his way, when you have raised your son to see the girl child, all the girls around him as second class citizen, when you have raised your son to look down on a female or any other woman around them. So when a woman says no, he is touched. His ego, his male ego is now what? Provoked. And then the tent to take those other steps that are not just wrong, they are also criminal actions. And that is why these conversations need to be sustained. And everyone needs to understand boundaries. Everyone needs to understand consent. It's sad that when you look at statistics from the um, Mirabe Center, you look at reports from Project Alert, you look at reports from Brave Art Initiative, you look at reports from the SAC centers, the sexual assault um, response centers and referral centers across the country. Till date, over 70% of the cases in these centers, either sexual violence or physical violence, are children. These are violence perpetrated against our children. And this really is a source of worry to as many of us. The violence against children survey that was conducted in 2014 and disseminated in 2016, showed the kind of situation that Nigeria is. You know, it was an emergency, but we still have not dealt with it. And COVID has come and has showed us that beyond the health crisis, we also have an SGBV crisis, a crisis within the crisis. So it's never too late. Let's start today to begin mm. to have this conversation. Let's start today to begin to take actions. Because sometimes we do a lot of talking without necessarily putting the requisite action that is needed in this work. Really, uh, Priscilla, this is a very broad topic. I want to give you a scenario, something I have seen happen, and I would like your expertise on how this problem should be solved. And it's not just an isolated case, it's something that happens across board. So in a household, right, a father rapes a child, or a, a, you know, a son rapes a house help, or a brother rapes a sister. But the point is that the abused and the abuser live in the same house, the same vicinity. What do you advise going forward? Should they be separated? Should the child be taken away from the father and should it be you know, housed somewhere else? Should the son be taken away? Like, what should be the process and the procedures to make sure that there's not a reoccurrence, a repeat 
of that abuse simply because they live under the same roof? First, I'd like to say that incestuous rape is one of the worst form of assault to ever happen. Beyond the criminality of the offense, it's we're looking at how our society is structured from religious fundamentalism to traditional fundamentalism and all the discussions around incest as what? A taboo, as a sacrilege, as something that is abnormal, and all other antecedents of incest. Regardless of whether it is father to a biological child, because there are children that are in your home that blood, blood may not be related to you. For instance, an underage house help, we should not even have an underage house help in our homes. All house help or nannies or housekeepers, whatsoever name that we use for them, are supposed to be 18 and what? And above. So it's already an anomaly that there is a help in the house that is a minor. That first is wrong. But to answer your question, this kind of scenarios that happen within a confined space, within the homes, my opinion, is first for there to be a separation. If not for any reason, for mental well-being. Separation is very needed because you just talked about repeated offense. There may not even be a repeated offense. Imagine waking up and seeing that face every day. I might have struck off with the first one, but as long as the person is there and I'm seeing the person every day, the person may not be coming back to redo what has happened, but for my own well-being, separation is the best. And that is why you see people like me push for shelter. We need more shelters in this country. Shelters are very critical places. You know, designated shelters. What we see happen in most of these scenarios is just to pick the child and take the child to, to the village. An orphanage. Yes. And often a vulnerable children home, they serve as a shelter. But we need shelter that are specific for this kind of issues. For instance, when we had the first shelter in this country, the Sophia's Place, the one that is run by Project Alert, it was clear that it was victims of domestic violence. So the kind of shelter management in that place, they had the kind of knowledge and the requisite skills, professionalism and expertise to deal with those issues. So I really beg for shelters. In the absence of shelters, we can use alternative homes. What I mean by alternative home is, is there any other relative that can take this child at this particular point in time? The best solution would have been for the abuser to be the one to go. But you know our own situation. The father who have abused will not go. So most probably it is the child who is the victim or the survivor that we may need to move. But preferably it should be the abuser that should be out of that space. But the entire environment needs definitely needs to be changed. The okay, child now, or the mother or whosoever is the victim can't continue to cohabit with the abuser. Now, let, let's also talk about um, the importance of making or having a you know very, very welcoming um, relationship with your child so that they, are, uh, they feel free to speak up when they are abused. Um, because I've also seen that that might be one of the challenges in homes where there's an uncle or there's a house help or there's an auntie who, you know, who's sexually harassing a little child, but, you know, the child doesn't feel comfortable enough with their parents or doesn't feel like their parents will believe them um, if they either speak up. Um, so let, let's also, you know, talk about the, the importance of that, having that type of relationship with your child uh, to protect them from abuse or, or make them comfortable enough to share with you if they are being abused. Um, you know, we tell people that communication is not complete except there's a feedback. Unfortunately, in my own situation, I had a mother that encouraged me to speak. But guess what? When I speak, I got reprimanded for speaking. We make the mistake oftentimes to encourage parents to say, give your children room to what? To speak. But we fail to also educate them that when they speak, this is how to what? To respond or to react, which are very critical. So as a teenage girl, I saw five attempted rape. Five. Teenager, 13 to 19. And in each of these incidents, I told my mom, guess what? She didn't take any action. She was happy that I spoke with her, but she blamed me. 
and I lived with the hurt for many years. But when I eventually gathered the courage to speak with my sister, she stood up and, you know, gave me the kind of response that I anticipated. Because the reason you are running to your mother as a child is because you expected what? To be believed, that's one. Protected. Then to be supported. So that support is very critical. Communication must go hand in hand with support. Our environment must be a supportive environment. Yes, your parents do not need to go out to go and fight. Maybe do a physical show of fight. But you know that this thing, your parents took it serious. Let me tell you something that happened one day. A neighbor attempted, you know, to sexually violate me. I fought him off. And, you know, even led to a physical struggle. I even inflicted an injury. And my mother walked with me to the neighbor's house to find out about what happened. We got there, you know, you expect a parent, you tell the other person's parent, and then you expect them to call their son. You know, let's hear their own um, version of the story, and then you take the next step. And the mother said, oh, uh, we are so sorry, no vest. And my mother reversed, and that was it. We just got back to our house, and it ended there. I felt when you meet disappointed and discouraged. And you do you know what happened after then? I didn't tell her any further one which is very dangerous. Because by the time you have encouraged your child to speak and the child opened up and then you react in an inappropriate way or in a judgmental way or in a further victimizing way. Yes, your parents are further victimize their children for speaking up. What were you doing there? What were you so wearing? So when the teacher asked you to come to the class, why didn't you tell the teacher you were not going? This is a child in a school. Oh my, we hope we get her when back. You are blaming her when the teacher cried. So these are all the various scenarios. And that mm -hmm. is why it is important that this communication needs to be effective communication, respectful communication okay. between parents and children, uh, between guidance and what. All right, Priscilla. Also, when parents now learn that they need to create an open environment for their kids to speak, what action should they take? For instance, in that situation where um, you know, you took your mom took you to the house of that neighbor. What should they have done? What should be the next steps? Should I have been reporting to the police? What steps should they take next? And even for the police, can we also talk about police training, police funding? Because sometimes you take that to the police and they'll tell you it's a family matter that they can't get involved. So, what really should be the next steps after, after parents are aware that their kids have been um, sexually violated or there's been an attempt to do so? So they are in my own scenario, um, using personal cases, I would have expected that my mother at least confronts the young man or that makes the mother brings the young man to at least make a commitment. It can be a verbal commitment to say, first, I'm sorry, apologize for what it does, and then makes a pledge for it never to repeat again. And my mother gives a clear warning, if it ever repeats again, this is what I'm, what I'm going to do to you. Mm. And then we leave. So... But there are parents that get confused when these things happen, so they don't know exactly what step to take. So it depends on the context. So we don't give blanket um, counsel to this kind of situation because you have to look at um, each case, and the um, circumstances or the scenarios that surround it. But I will always encourage parents, you can reach out to NGOs, you can reach out to social welfare officers and ministries that can guide you on the step to take. But we know that um, fiscal violence, for instance, if your child is bullied in school, you have to take it up with the management because there are every chance that your child is not the only victim to that bully. Mm. All right. So let the management sit up to their responsibilities. Your child went to school to learn. So she can't keep coming back with um, bruises and, you know, all the other stress of um, physical assault that is uh, receiving from other students in the school. So there are times that you take it as, you know, family to family discussion. There are times you involved the authorities of the place where the incidents have happened. And there are times that you take legal actions. You go to the police. All right. um, for police, it's sad. I have worked with the police for the past 10 years. Um, a large part of my work and advocacy has been for the Nigerian police. Um, if we do not, I'm saying it clearly today, if Nigerian government do not in, in, invest in case investigations, we will continue to be in this cycle that we are. Mm. Okay. So previously okay. I used to say administrative. No, it's not just admin now. It is case investigation itself. 
infernal climes in civilized countries, in more exposed countries, who understand what it is to support the administrative administration of the criminal justice system. They know that in involved funding and trainings, that you train the person is not just enough. The, the, the requisite funding needs to be made available. Mm -hmm. We do too much talk as a government. They don't put the required money there. Oftentimes, we go to the police station and we complain that the investigating police officer is demanding money from us after we have made a complaint. The question is, if an IPO is assigned to a case, if at 37 years old, I have a ward that is sexually violated and I've gone to the police to make arrest, this police officer does not have any means of transportation to make an arrest. This uh, um, police officer does not have any support in his police division to even visit the crime scene. He does not have any support from his division to take me for the requisite medical screen and all others. Then what happens is either he does, don't, he does nothing or he mandates me to provide the means. Mm, right. And these are all replicant districts all across the country, even this your is neighbor so states, FCT and everywhere. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. You know, I, I think it's also important to mention, you know, besides the funding and infrastructure at the security level, uh, there's also those police officers who also victim shame and victim blame um, instead of, you know, going ahead to investigate. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a whole new conversation that will take hours. Uh, but we thank you also uh, for joining us this morning and for the work thank that you, you do um, in Gara and, of course, in, you know, in many parts of Nigeria. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us this morning, and um, we wish you a very interesting day ahead. Have a great one. Thank you for having me. I hope our session shed more light to other people, and we'll see a safer world for our children in Nigeria. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you. All right. And that's where we wrap up uh, Thursday morning's edition of The Breakfast here on Plus TV Africa, Sex Education for Kids. Uh, we hope, of course, that you've learned something and you will pass that message over to others and also to your kids. If you missed out, catch up on our social media platforms. It's simply at Plus TV Africa on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. I am Annette Felixing. Thank you for joining us today. I am Osao Ye Obama.